Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, I'm very pleased to be here in this beautiful town where so much wisdom came out, but very ambiguous wisdom. Um, and, and so it's appropriate to be here because this uh, one question that was asked here, can Europe manage structural reforms, is going to be interpreted in many different ways, like the oracle of Delphi could also be interpreted in many different ways. So I'm going to have some PowerPoint, and since I cannot read it well sitting, I'm going to stand up, if you allow me. So I'm going to interpret the question to mean um, somewhat different from what Kevin um, was talking about, which I think is extremely important, the quality of uh, institutions, and I have nothing to say about it except that this is probably going to be more important than what I have to bring forward. So but the way I interpret this here is a catch-up term for a whole agenda aiming at uh, expanding the scope of market forces in the economy, right? in the hope that this would lead to more economic growth. Here I show you <coughs> the way it started with the Frankfurt-Brussels consensus. Some may have called it the Washington consensus. And the way I represent this is as follows. Um, on the horizontal axis, you have on the, the starting point a plant economy. And when you go all the way to the right, you go to free markets. Right? And on the vertical axis, I said that economic growth. And the paradigm that came out from Washington and then later Frankfurt, Brussels, is that if you move away from planification and introduce more and more flexibility through structural reforms, that will lead you to an increase in economic growth, like a linear process, right? Um, you may think then, why does it appear to be so difficult sometimes to move up? Because this line is moving up and everybody should be cheering. Let's do it. But it turns out to be much more difficult. Why is that? Well, because the world looks oops, a little different. Here I show you the reality of that relationship between plant economy on the left-hand side and free markets. And I think we can say there was a consensus that when we start from A and we start increasing the importance of markets with more flexibility, that will tend to increase economic growth. But are we sure this is a linear process? And the answer is no. At some point, this may stop. And in fact, it may become negatively sloped. Right? Creating then, at some point, resistance and, and well-informed resistance of going further. So where is Europe today? Is it on the left-hand side of this peak or on the right-hand side? We don't know. Also, this is a very aggregate picture. Structural reform is kind of thousands of different um, changes that you introduce that may have different effects. And, and, and therefore, the aggregate may hide very different um, dynamics at the micro level. But let me now go into the, the sources of this nonlinearity. Where does it come from? It's important to understand why this is not a linear process. At some point, if you go too far with structural reforms, too many flexibilities, you may in fact end up with less economic growth. And here I identify two, two reasons, um, very generally, why you may have this nonlinearity. One I call the Coase theorem, right? Economists among you may know what it is about. It's Coase started from the observation that many economic activities are not organized in markets, but are organized within organizations, firms and other organizations, with the hierarchical structure where somebody tells you, you should, shall do that, like in a plant economy. Right? And other activities are organized by markets. And where is the dividing line? It has to do with transaction costs. Right? Um, 
agents will try to reduce transaction costs. If, if you do everything to the markets, this may lead to a lot of transaction costs because you have to monitor contracts, you have to implement them, uh, you have to enforce them, and this creates a lot of costs. And as a result, sometimes agents will say, we don't want the markets, we are going to do it within hierarchical structures. That's the cost theorem. But you can see here that if you impose the economy to go all the way to more and more markets, you may hit this problem of transaction costs. I'll give an example in a minute. The second has to do with the political economy of structural reforms that uh, Agnès already has been mentioning. And it has to do with the fact that these structural reforms lead to winners and losers, and therefore to incentives to use the political process rather than the markets and economic processes. So let me go into these two very quickly. And for the course theorem, I'm going to take an example of employment protection legislation, right? Um, it has been very much an act of fate that we have to eliminate employment protection legislation. But how much? How far should we go? That's the issue, right? Um, and in order to see that, let, let's look at our, our graph, right? Uh, let me go back. Um, suppose this is now just uh, applying this graph for employment protection. And on the left-hand side here, you have 100% employment protection, like in a plant economy. You can never be fired, you cannot be sacked. Clearly, people will not be motivated to work hard, right? No incentives. If you lose an employment protection, yes, no surprise, you will have more efficiency. People will start taking initiatives and, and, and you move up. But how far should you go? Should you go to 0% protection where you can be sacked the next day? Is that the answer? And the answer is probably not, because that creates a lot of, um, a lot of cost here. Here's the, what I wanted to, to, to mention. Um, if you have zero employment protection, workers can be dismissed without notice, and they can leave the job without notice, then firms face huge transaction costs, right? They have to all the time look for other people because those that they were hired leave the job and as a result they will not be willing to invest in human capital and the workers will not be willing to invest in human capital on the job and as a result you will have low productivity, low economic growth. So too much structural reform, too much flexibility hits back. And I think the UK has gone too far. We, we often hear on the continent, we should do like the UK, uh, more flexibility, less employment protection. Wait a minute. This kind of reduction of protection, or employment protection may be one of the reasons why productivity in the UK is so much lower than in France, for example, right? Because we, if, if you can be sacked, why invest in human capital, right? And, and you don't have a productive economy. So the the optimal level will be somewhere between zero and 100%. And where are we? Well, for all these structural reforms, the same question arises. Where exactly are we? And we have done so little research to find out. And too many people have been driven by an ideology that says, let's go all the way. And I think that's not what we should do. On the political economy, just a few things. Uh, this is the second reason why we have this nonlinearity. This has to do with the fact that, yes, structural reform, more flexibility, more markets, creates winners and losers. And as a result, this leads to political economy effects, social and political unrest. People find it unfair. They look to politicians. You get political instability that reduces investment and therefore also less economic growth. So the, the political economy effect of structural reforms also produce this nonlinearity that uh, we have not analyzed sufficiently well to be able to say that's what you have to do. Right? Maybe we have done too much of these structural reforms. And we have done a lot of um, structural reforms. Here I show you the OECD measure of structural reforms um, in, in the area of employment protection. Right? And, and the, the red line is the Eurozone. It had a lot of employment protection and then reduced it. And, and in particular, it reduced it right during the crisis, right? At the, the worst possible moment. That you, when there was a recession, employment protection was reduced. As a result, firms could fire more easily. But since there was a recession, nobody wanted to hire. 
And surprise, surprise, people are unhappy. And they turn against the politicians who have started all this. That's what we did there, right? So this was ill-conceived. Um, note also that the, the green line, these are the non-Eurozone um, countries, right? They have increased employment protection during that time, right? Um, probably it's an inverse causality there because they were growing faster. And when you grow faster, you create a dynamics that allows you to push for more employment protection. Right? So again, the, the political economy um, is, is, is very important, right? So there have been lots of structural reforms. They have been implemented. It's far from clear whether all these have boosted economic growth for the reasons that I've given, right? And in fact, when you do the econometrics of this, you find almost nothing. Uh, structural reforms, flexibility does not do it for you, right? What does do it for you? Investment. Investment is the key to economic growth, not structural reforms, not more flexibility, right? And public investment in particular. And what have we done during the last 80 years? Reduce public investment. We have introduced the silliest possible rule um, in, the, in Europe, and that is that you cannot finance public investment by issuing bonds anymore. Right? And as a result, we are surprised that public investment goes down, reducing economic growth. So I think we should change that. A new fiscal compact is necessary where we would have a golden rule allowing public investment to be financed by bond issue. And that will do much more than what we have done up to now in terms of structural reforms that risk creating even more populist backlash that we have uh, seen recently. So I, my end proposal is a moratorium on further structural reforms. Thank you. <laughs>